It's surreal, frankly, that my all-time favorite anime would not only get a spin-off in 2018, but it would go on to be one of the best and popular anime of the season. One of the greatest merits of Ashita no Jo is its iconography. Very few series boast such widespread influence on manga and anime, so from the beginning I knew Megalobox would be dripping, oozing with Jo references. Here's all the most significant references I could rationally synthesize. I didn't want to bring it so far as JD has hair just like Joe had hair, but some of these connections are going to get crazy. Before I get into it though, I want to make clear that just because Megalobox took many of these elements from Joe, that does not make it inferior. In fact, playing homage to Ashita no Joe was the reason this was made. The logo that shows at the start of every OP and the end of every ED is for the Joe 50th anniversary. So what I'm saying is, every single one of these Joe references is a good thing. But just so I can give credit where credit is due, at the end of every episode I'm going to talk about the multiple great elements that are original to Megalobox. Also, of course this spoils the entire show. And yes, some of these spoilers are themselves Joe spoilers. But I just want to reassure everybody that A, a lot of Joe spoilers aren't actually referenced, so I'm going to avoid giving away those spoilers as best as I can. Kudos to Megalobox for not spoiling Joe. And B, Joe is not a series that can be spoiled with spoilers. Trust me. <laughs> I'd like to start with saying that many characters in Megalobox are meant to be parallels to characters in Joe, so they're designed similarly and have similar characterizations. Junk Dog is obviously a character parallel to Joe. JD heading towards the ocean is reminiscent of Joe trying to escape Juvie with the ocean as the horizon. There's even a shot of Joe leaping off the cliff as he resolves himself to face his rival Rikishi, similar to JD driving off the cliff. Also, both series open with the protagonist traveling somewhere in a wasteland. In fact, they're shot heading in the same direction. Shirato Yukiko is a character parallel to Shiraki Yoko. Yukiko organizes Megalonia in much the same way Yoko orchestrates many of Joe's later fights, when she inherits Shiraki Jim from her father, just like how Yukiko in Megalobox inherits the Shirato group from her grandfather. Real boxing is a play on Rikishi's quote. Which happens when he watches Joe's fight with Wolf, deeming Joe a real boxer, and thus resolving himself to their ultimate fight. The Abuhachi store owner is a small parallel to what I believe is an anime original character in season 1, named Oigawa Gohei, who appoints himself Tangai Jim's doctor, which would make sense since he acts like a doctor towards JD's gear and his bike. Though, he could also be a parallel to Noriko's father, cause he runs a grocery store? Eh. JD eating seeds or popcorn, whatever he has, and trickshotting them into his mouth is a reference to Joe eating and flicking popcorn at Carlos during his sparring match. King of Kings was actually one of Jose's nicknames. JD showing disinterest in the King of Kings and whatever Yukiko has to say is much aligned with Joe's dismissal of Yoko and the boxing community. The division of the slums and the city are contrasted, much like the slums of Doya, where Joe lives, to the city of Tokyo. JD's lack of ID is akin to Joe being an orphan. Both have ambiguous origins. Nanbu is a character parallel to Tange Danpei. Our introduction to Nanbu is him betting on dog racing, a gambling vice, akin to the introduction of Danpei with his alcohol vice. And both of them quit these vices in the same episode, though that doesn't stop Nanbu from also being an alcoholic like Dompe. Drunk Monk is likely a nod to Dompe as a character, who is an infamous drunk and aesthetically somewhat like a monk. It's the HQ of these underground, unofficial boxing matches, just like the sort that Dompe himself established when Joe is in Juvie. JD calls Nanbu Osan, or Pops, which is exactly what Joe always called Dompe. <laughs> Nambu goes behind JD's back on established plans, much like how Dompei would often go behind Joe's back on some plans. 
Nambu promising to find JD a real opponent is just like how Joe challenged Yoko to find him an opponent as strong as Rikishi. JD stops an uppercut right at the chin of his opponent, right on the bell, much like when Rikishi stopped his uppercut on Joe, right on the bell. This is embellished more in Megalobox, but Yukiko's way of articulating this moment as a starting line is like how Yoko says, this is where it starts. Yuri is a character parallel to Rikish Toru. There are a few shots that are very similar to each other. Both Yuri and Rikishi are undefeated when we first meet them. Yuri being the fan favorite is the same with Rikishi often being the fan favorite. And Yuri's fierce loyalty to Yukiko is a parallel to Rikishi's protective loyalty to Yoko. However, it will be made more apparent soon that he has a close second parallel with Jose. Yuri only refers to Yukiko as Ona, which is similar to Rikishi only ever referring to Yoko as Ojo-san. Yukiko offers to reimburse JD for the bike, but JD refuses. This echoes back to how Yoko would make herself feel better by being charitable with the slum children, but Joe calls her out on her shit. JD mouthing off to Yukiko, even when this is the first time they've met, is much like how Joe had serious misgivings about Yoko from the very beginning and through the whole show. The encounter on the bridge is most similar to the scene in Joe outside the theater, where Joe challenges Rikishi to a fight, and both reveal themselves to be interested in fighting each other seriously. The rain is also a callback to Joe and Rikishi's fight in the rain, which is practically their only encounter with each other alone. It embodies that feeling JD and Yuri have of being alone together, until Yukiko interrupts, that is, much like how Yoko and Danpei interrupt the rain fight. The way Yuri surprises JD to a fight is also akin to when Rikishi surprises Joe to their fight in the rain. Also, Yuri and Rikishi own the same hoodie. When Yuri says, nobody's here to stop me tonight, it reminds me of the line Rikishi says during the scene outside the theater. The way Nambu tries to stop JD from fighting Yuri is much like how Danpei would try to stop Joe from fighting his rivals, like Rikishi and Carlos. Nambu getting punched out by JD is much like how Danpei often got punched out by Joe. And a quick note on the ED, the neon lights seem to be a callback to both the video game aesthetic of the first Joe 2 OP, as well as the frequent establishing shots of neon signs in Joe 1. Okay, so now I get to talk about the original bits that I love. And to start, JD having a motorcycle is fucking great. I don't know how he got it, and it would have been so cool if Joe had one too, even though it wouldn't have made much sense given how poor he was. So this one shot with JD gasping as he pictures himself dying in the ring is a great departure from Joe's character because it's something to hold him back from going all the way with it. The concept of a boxing tournament orchestrated by Yukiko is brilliant because not only does it fit in line with what Yoko would do, it makes for a great through line given how short this series lasts. Which, speaking of the length of the series, I think it's in nice contrast to how drawn out and long running Joe is. Is a very interesting question for Megalobox to pose, since that's a question one could potentially pose in Joe. Each of the major fighters in the series is a champion in their own regard, which I'll hold off of spoiling. I love the gear, both as an aesthetic to make each boxer seem unique, but also as a thematic backbone to what's considered real boxing. It shouldn't be about what gear or background or privilege you have, what matters is your talent, drive, and believing in yourself. And that's a theme in Joe, only told in a unique and colorful way. Starting out with JD being a boxer, but forced to throw fights, is a great source of conflict. You don't have to spend all this time having him learn how to box, but you still get to see him improve. The first meeting of Yukiko almost getting run over by JD was thrilling. Joe's relationship with Yoko and Rikishi was much slower, so to make this much of an impression in such a short burst of time was well planned. This vision JD gets of a fast moving dusty road is a fast and easy motif to represent his desire for a real fight. I also like the small rain symbol to represent who Yuri is to JD. It's tranquil, his head is clear, and it's just this guy in front of him. 
This line about believing that the faith in yourself is real is a great way to sum up JD's goals, and quite likely everyone in the series' goal, one way or another. And credit where credit is due, that's a good fucking line. <laughs> JD's first punch at Yuri is a right hook, which is the first punch Joe throws at Rikishi. Only Joe connects, JD does not. However, his wild miss is actually just like Joe's wild miss with a right upper, which is both Yuri's and Rikishi's first dodge to their punches. When Yuri first punches JD and slices JD's face, it's much like when Rikishi slices a similar cut as he lands his first hit on Joe in their official match. Yuri challenges himself by only using his left hand in his first match with JD, much like how in Joe and Rikishi's first match, Rikishi challenges himself to knock out Joe in under a minute. Both challenges fail. This shot of the crossing arms is mm, not quite, not quite. Stupid minor, but Joe has this signature laugh that JD just seems to have too. <laughs> JD saying he's having fun is just like in Joe's match with Carlos. And here we have the OP! There's a lot to unpack here. The wolf motif references the first compilation film's OP, titled Beautiful Wolves, and a lyric from the second Joe ED, or Today, I'm a Wolf. The shot of the wolf howling at the sunset with large foreground reminds me of the first shot in the first Joe OP, where he's jogging against a sunset with large foreground, as well as the last shot of the first AD where he's running towards the sun. This shot of prowling away from the sun is a very clear nod to the iconic second OP in A and J 2. This abstract shot of wolves falling down into some abyss is a callback to the first season in Joe where Joe is falling down in a similar sort of abyss, which happens to feature in the second OP of the first season. First time we see Sachio's hat, which is colored and modeled much like Joe's own hat, Yuri's robes are nearly identical to Rikishi's robes. This might also be a bit of a stretch. This shot of the wolf looking at the moon reminds me of Joe's speech to Noriko about burning brightly. And you can kind of see the embers flying from the bottom. It's the first time they show up in the OP. Repeating the lyrics like is much like the lyrics in the first OP. This shot of the cord and the wolf's teeth reminds me of this one shot in the second Joe 2 OP of him swinging his bag around. Translates roughly to vomit out the sand and sweat, which Vomiting is a nod to that period where Joe instinctively threw up if he punched someone in the face. Wandering through a junkyard filled with tires is much like what Joe does in the second OP to Joe too. Even kicking a tire. Correlating the characters with wolves or beasts is alluded to very often in Joe. With such episode titles in season 1 like Those are the Eyes of a Beast, Law of the Stray Dog, and <laughs> Don't Judge the Wolf. Yes, that is the kanji for wolf, and no, this is way before they introduced the character named Wolf. JD almost lands a blow to Yuri's temple, which is reminiscent of the blow Joe does land on Rikishi's head that downs him in their pro match. Yuri's decisive blow is much like Rikishi's decisive blow in their first encounter, with Joe slash JD coming in with a punch and Yuri slash Rikishi coming in with a strong right jab to the face. The way JD falls here is somewhat similar to this shot. Yuri saying it's over before the referees say it's over is differently worded but translated the same as Rikishi calling a match over before the referees confirm. <laughs> this scene of JD calling after Yuri is a mix of scenes. First, the way JD calls Yuri out by resting in the ring in front of everyone is framed much like how Joe calls out Jose when he says, next to you. JD saying, let's keep going, is just like how Joe and Rikishi's fight in the rain was cut short, and Joe insisted they keep going. And, most blatantly, Yuri leaving with his back turned and JD reaching out for him is 
exactly like when Rikishi leaves prison with Joe chasing after him. JD visualizing Yuri and stopping himself from riding off this cliff, almost killing himself, is a lot like when Joe tried to swim off the island where he's imprisoned, and seeing this vision of Rikishi stops him from doing it. Several of these shots, after JD almost drives off the cliff again, are taken straight out of the end of episode 1 of Joe 2. Side comment, this and a few other backgrounds in particular remind me of Shichiro Kobayashi's work, who happened to do the backgrounds for Joe 2. Actually, it turns out the art director here, Jiro Kono, was also the art director for several Tazaki anime, including Space Adventure Cobra, Blackjack the Movie, and uh, the Snow Queen. Yukiko's desire for this glorious future for her and Yuri recalls back to something Yoko once said to Rikishi. <laughs> This admiration Yukiko shows towards Yuri seems somewhat romantic, which is how Yoko felt about Rikishi, subtextually. JD punching out the guy right away, defying the establishment, is much like all those times Joe would just start fights and knock people out, thus defying the establishment. Fujimaki is a character parallel to Goromaki Gondo. Same green suit, works for the Yakuza, we first meet Fujimaki and Gondo at a restaurant. He actually has the same eyebrow scar too, only for some reason the scar is there in the manga and in Joe 1's version of Goromaki, but isn't there for Joe 2, so of course I almost missed it. The way blood is used to show how hard Nambu is hitting his head against the table calls back to how hard Rikishi bangs his fists on the door, begging to be let out. Fujimaki asking for Nambu's other eyeball means that he's sharp to people's physical weaknesses, much like how Goromaki was sharp to Wolf's physical weakness. And lastly for this episode, there's this super obvious reference when they're making JD's ID. The birth date listed on the ID is 100 years to the day after the original Joe manga ended, May 13th, 1973. Oh, and JD happens to name himself Joe. This outlet JD has of self-harm by riding off this cliff is very compelling. He's created this awful habit for every time he's had to lose, and it could probably kill him. This is a great way to establish that he's emotionally unstable, much like how Joe was. The focus on music in this flashback sequence was great. It reminded me of how Joe would turn to whistling as a way to decompress, only in a cool modern way because they didn't have portable cassette tapes back then. I don't want to include it as a reference to the whistling though, because he's only shown to be doing this as a kid. I fucking love Fujimaki's thing with cooking and pressuring people to eat or drink whatever he offers them. There's no way to tell if what he's feeding you are just a part of his victims in some way. It's intimidating as hell. Also, the threat of taking Nambu's other eye was especially thrilling. They hardly did anything like that with Dompei's missing eye. Overall, Fujimaki's importance in the series is what I would have loved to see for Goemaki Gondo in Joe. Gondo has very little influence on the story overall, but he was just a super cool and memorable character for how rarely he shows up. I gotta say, the way they come up with calling JD Joe after this billboard sign to stick it to the district life was really clever. I didn't see it coming at all. The scar symbols are probably the best symbolism I've seen since Onisama A's stained glass window. How every little experience in life is something that stays with you. I think Berserk played with this a little bit too. But yeah, all the fighters have these super obvious cool looking scars, and it might be very interesting to see what they do with the characters that don't have scars, like Yuri. When I first saw this scar, I thought it was meant to be shaped like the wolf's ear in the OP, but then Phantom Sage said it looked like a J for Joe, and I'm like, God fucking damn Nambu venturing into the official boxing association office is much like how all the times Dompe would have to venture there by himself. The fact that the bigwigs recognize Nambu is just like how Dompe had previous connections with the bigwigs. The boxers all having animals as part of their names is a nod to several opponents in Joe, Mammoth Nishi, Wolf Kanagushi, and Tiger Ozaki. While not being this literal, when Joe makes his debut, he also has to fight his way up to Rikishi, and out of this bracket of six-round bouts. 
This shot of the construction workers is a wholesome callback to how Dompe would have to work in construction to support Joe. It represented him being a productive member of society. I initially surmised Pepe Iglesias was a character parallel to Carlos Rivera, but as you'll see later in the show, beyond a handful of design commonalities, it's not really the case, and there's another fighter who is a closer parallel. Yuri's intense training with the mask is much like Rikishi's intense weight training. This shot of JD coming down to the living room is just like Joe's loft in Dompe's gym. Ah yes, Rikishi and Joe too ate an apple once. What am I doing? The kids are character parallels to the group of kids in Joe. These characters are designed pretty similar. They both steal things at some point. There's no adult supervision in sight. Sachio in particular is a character parallel to Sachi. Just a name, really, though both of them have bags and are very loud and outspoken and probably the leaders of the group. Though I will also say, due to his larger role going forward, he ends up fulfilling Nishi's role later on in Joe. The kids stealing cameras for candy is just like what the Joe kids often did, stealing for Joe so they can get candy. Potemkin Higashi is a character parallel to Mammoth Nishi, in design and mannerisms, as well as being an early antagonist. JD stepping in to defend Sachio from the store owner, and thus spark Sachio's interest, is just like how Sachi first met Joe when he saves her from a group of thugs. Having their training base under a bridge is just like the Tange Gym being under the Bridge of Tears, in pretty much the same orientation too. Shark Semejima, or Maneater, is a character parallel to Wolf Kanagushi. On top of being designed similar and having carnivorous animals for names, Nambu's plan to target a fight with him in order to get attention is just like how Joe targeted Wolf to get attention and get himself officially licensed. Uh, would you fancy that Shark happens to be using Kim's Chamu Chamu technique? Kim's signature move that has killed two of his prior opponents, where he pins them against the ropes, unable to attack while he just makes them dance until they drop. Sachio's father looks hauntingly similar to Jose Mendoza, and it would make sense, because Jose is the only rival character that has any interaction with Joe's hat. When Sachio attempts to steal the prototype gear, it's a lot like when Sachi and the other kids infiltrate Asia Jim to spy on Wolf, which... I should mention, this happens. I got this! Hi! To go along with that, when Sachio is subsequently caught and JD has to go rescue him, it matches up with when the Joe kids get caught at Asia Gym and are beat up by Wolf and his gym, prompting Joe to avenge them in his subsequent match. JD does the smart thing and uses the turtle stance to block Potemkin's attack, which is a stance that Joe uses against Aoyama to get the upper hand. Nambu suggests a count- nope, we are not- we're not quite there yet. I think going to the extreme with the animal names is really fun. It was never this ridiculous in Joe. Megalobox has a great way of establishing its own iconography in the names, the different gear, the scars, as well as all the graffiti, logos, and posters everywhere. The cross in Nambu's truck says, Dios aprieta pero no auga, which means God holds on to you but doesn't choke you, or God will test you without ever giving you more than what you can handle which I thought was encouraging and added more of that Latin culture that you see a lot of in Joe. Nice boat. Sachio is a stupidly well-realized character. He actually has influence on the story, unlike Sachi. His multi-purpose iPad, his mysterious history, his knowledge of megaloboxing are all unique to the character, and he's very well integrated without him getting too annoying, which the Joe gang would often grow to be a lot of the time. Okay, I didn't want to list this as a reference because this is just something all boxers have to do, but I had to mention it. God, I love this shot. It, it reminds me of all those shots of Joe doing road work. It feels so good, man. 
Lastly, at this point, I want to mention how cool it is that every episode title has some variation of the word death included in it, with the to be continued as not dead yet. Really juicy use of foreshadow. For that matter, I love the old school eye catches. Joe never actually had any of those. This background character stood out to me as being stupidly similar to Gorobaki, only with the hair, the hat, the suit, the chin. Entering the ring in a way that surprises the crowd, as well as the audience watching the show, in this case not having any gear, but also later in the show when Joe comes out with gear, is much like when Joe enters the ring to fight Wolf, and he, Dompe, and Nishi all mysteriously have a shit ton of cuts and bruises on them. Joe that is a common expression in general, but I've been waiting for JD to say it because that's something Joe always says and I love it. This fight interestingly has a lot of parallels to Joe's first actual boxing match against Rikishi. Shark is tossing him around and JD is just running around trying to get away. His first down is similar to Joe's down when Rikishi has that last attempt at a KO in the first minute. When both Nambu and Dompei get a little bit aggressive in between rounds, they both get soaked in the head. Three take on that hit! Yeah! Nambu smashing the mouthpiece in JD's mouth right as the bell goes off is a reference to Dompei smashing the mouthpiece in Joe's mouth at the bell of his first match with Rikishi. The paralysis of JD's body telling him he's afraid is just like how Joe's body would act for a period of time when he'd throw up if he punched anyone in the head. Just realized that Sachio calls Nambu Ochan instead of how JD calls him Osan, which is actually what Nishi calls Dompei. Ocha. One note on this shot of JD sitting in episode 4, while the hands are the same, the expression and use of lighting is not. So this and subsequent scenes like it aren't really a callback to that last shot. Which I'm not showing here, alright? You've seen it. The way JD used footwork to overcome his fear is just like when Joe used footwork for the first time to overcome his fear when he fought Aoyama. That punch was a oh, not yet. Well, at, at least JD punched Shark in the jaw, which is a callback to Wolf's jaw getting broken by Joe at the end of their match. This shot of the glove is similar to this shot in the first OP. Kind, kind of. <laughs> and this shot of the huge sun is another callback to the classic sunset shot. JD having a string of wins right when he debuts is just like how Joe has a string of surprising consecutive wins when he debuts and when he makes his comeback. Also the way they gloss over this streak is exactly how they gloss over Joe's consecutive streak, only that was between his first fight and his fight with Wolf, while as here it's between his fight with Shark and Aragaki. Gotta admit, this shot looks an awful lot like this shot! Nambu almost naming their gym after himself is a callback to Tange Gym, where Dompei names it after himself. Gearless Joe is an excellent idea! It's old school and exactly something Joe would be crazy enough to try. Interesting contrast to note, Joe actually gets a very warm reception in his first professional match in comparison to JD's rough reception. Joe never got nerves like this. He's been nervous when fighting Aoyama or Young B Kim, but nothing this serious. Really awesome imagery of the feet sinking into the mat. I don't even think I saw something like that in Ippo, and that series has done everything. It was a good idea to have Shark be a frequent foul player. Joe's opponents have had their fair share of foul moves, but nothing that tense. It was a good way to make him stand apart from Wolf. Because as far as I'm aware, Wolf never fought dirty. Sachio pointing out that JD won't be able to win on his own was a great moment. I don't think I can point to a moment like that in Joe. Though Joe and Dompei at least do come to a mutual understanding of their partnership by the time they get to his debut match. Montaging through those next two opponents was a super smart move. They are playing it very economically. Very well done. This is a great time to make note that this show is not about boxing exactly. You're not really watching this for 
professional boxing. You're watching this for the characters and what they have to go through. What opponents matter to JD when it comes to his growth as a character? These two fights didn't have any of that, so that's why they skipped over them. It's the same thing that happens with Joe. That's what you get in Joe. It's great. I just want to give credit to this small character moment when Yukiko remembers that sensation of getting her hand slapped by JD. It's a really good way to show that he left an impact on her and not just that she remembers him. That's a great name for the gym. We'll find out next episode why he wanted to name it Nambu Gym because it was the name of his previous gym, which I think is a bit of a nod to the previous gym being like Tange Gym. Yabunuma isn't exactly a character parallel that I can make out. The closest there is would be an anime original character from Joe 2, an investigative reporter named Kiyoshi Suga, who would provide key insider information and connections, and also drives a sick car. Sort of like how Yabunuma connected Nabu to Araki. The concept of Aragaki being a former boxer under Nambu is a stellar source of conflict that Joe never explored the potential of with Dompei's character. Aragaki is a character parallel to Young B. Kim. Both talk in very calm, neutral tones, both are over 30 years old, and both are suffering from a form of PTSD caused by a war. Yang Bi Kim's had to do with that being a child who lost both his parents in the Korean War, and Aragaki being a soldier in an unspecified war zone, being the victim of a bomb explosion. The focus on Aragaki's eyes with butterflies in them is a reflection of the focus on Kim's eyes being cold and computer-like. When Aragaki says megaloboxing is what saved him, that's much like how boxing saved Kim from spiraling. Nambu hesitating on fighting Aragaki is much like how Dompei was hesitant on fighting Kim. While not nearly as extreme, the lasting scars and loss of Aragaki's legs is much like how Kim's stomach is permanently that of a small child's. Very small, but white tea and red towel makes JD. The way Sachio goes digging into more info about Aragaki is just like how Dompei, Yoko, and Suga would do their research on Kim, both of which stumbling into how badly damaged Kim and Aragaki leave their opponents. Having the Veterans Association support Aragaki as his gym is the same as the army supporting Kim's career as a boxer. This scene in Aragaki's bedroom reminds me a ton of this scene in Joe where Kim keeps washing his hands of this blood that he sees but it's not even there, though this scene was admittedly incredibly more harrowing. JD meeting up and talking with Aragaki before their fight is much the same way Kim met up with Joe before their fight, only it's in an interesting reversal where JD comes to Aragaki and not the other way around. Both JD and Joe slip in the opening few seconds of the match and get downed in the first round. First quick thing to note was how different a choice it was to show what happened to Aragaki first before anything else. When it came to Kim, we never learned anything about him until hours away from the fight, so at the end. So the structure of how this character was implemented into the show was very unique to this series. I like that they made Aragaki a soldier rather than just a victim of war. It was also a smart move to make this war ambiguous and not something specific. That detail is obsolete, all things considered, and makes it a little more universal. More props to the motifs, this time being the Death Butterfly. Really cool. So it wasn't simply that Nambu and Aragaki share this connection, but also the fact that Aragaki was like his star player going 10-0 before he had to leave for service. It's really interesting to have Nambu come from such a promising background only to be let down. This gym specifically for disabled veterans is a seriously good touch. You're able to share so much empathy for their side of the struggle. I really like that ticket saying Carpe Diem, and I was going to explain what it means, but the show just does it for me anyway later on, so we'll leave it at that. I like Carpe Diem. I thought it was quite the fitting name to put on this ticket that subtly prevents Aragaki from killing himself. Mad props to this whole scene when Aragaki returns to the gym only to find it abandoned. It reminds me of how Joe returns to Tange Gym after so long. It's interesting to think what that would have felt like for Joe if Dompei disappeared like Nambu did. Good nightmare sequence. 
he really does blame Nambu in a sense. All for Tomorrow or Ashita no Tame is an alteration of For the Sake of Tomorrow or Ashita no Tame ni, which is what Dompei calls his first boxing lessons to Joe. Ashita no tame ni. Nanda JD has two downs in this episode that mimic two downs that Joe suffers in his fight with Kim. His first is an uppercut. Oh! and his second is a body blow. <laughs> this fight so far has the most flashbacks littered throughout, much like how Joe's fight with Kim had the most flashbacks up to that point. JD agitating Aragaki and thus making him lose his focus is much like how Joe agitated Kim making him lose focus. Miyagi insisting Aragaki finish it in the next round is much like Kim's coach insisting Kim end it the next round. Aragaki asking why JD stands is just like how inexplicable it was that Joe kept standing up against Kim. This really good rotating shot is a callback to this shot from Joe 2 that's often used. Mmm, okay. At this point, I am realizing what this show is doing, but I'll hold off on explaining it until later. JD collapsing after he wins is much like the end of several of Joe's fights. Aragaki voluntarily retiring after their fight is exactly what Kim does after his fight with Joe. Glenn Burroughs is a vague character parallel to Tiger Ozaki. Similar names, very privileged in the establishment, both represent the KBC, in Joe it's the Kunitomo Boxing Club, and in Megalobox it's the Killer Bomb Crew, and both really seem to resent JD or Joe for their popularity. Yuri not participating in the party and looking bored is something I'd argue is in line with Rikishi's characterization. He was higher ranked and well respected, but he never really participated in the association like the other boxers, such as Wolf or Tiger. He was even kicked out for a long time after he beat up a spectator, so Rikishi's always been a very distant member, much like Yuri is here. I was willing to bet that Mikio is a character parallel to Jose Mendoza, the ascot, mannerisms, his formal way of speaking, and the fact his sister is Yukiko gives this vibe of him being more of a family man, which was a big part of Jose's character. However, as we'll see in these upcoming episodes, he actually carries more narrative weight as a character parallel to Carlos Rivera. I really liked that red hot iron analogy. It describes the original Joe too perfectly. I've never seen the way Aragaki voluntarily forfeits like this in Joe or in Ippo. I think that was a good way for JD to beat Aragaki without him necessarily being better than Aragaki. Seriously good catharsis at the end of this fight. Kim got exactly none of that. I'd say Aragaki overall got a much better treatment and implementation in this series than Kim ended up getting. And another small nod to this moment with Aragaki believing in JD as well. It was really nice. Holy shit! Yukiko having a brother participating in Megaloboxing adds a whole new layer that the series never touched upon. It's a very interesting new wrench in the works. And at this point I'd like to address how different this sport is compared to traditional boxing. There's no round limit, there didn't seem to be weight classes, and the overall practice of all these matches happening so close in time with each other, and such things as how public sparring matches aren't a thing, not to mention the gear which, aside from Mikio's later on, don't seem to do much else besides hit harder and faster, and overall make megaloboxing just a more dangerous sport. I think it's a moot point to ask if getting punched by these things would kill you, since boxing is already a deadly combat sport. If it was all like Potemkins, I would agree. That's literally fucking steel. But I think that's why the gear is shown to be checked before matches, so it doesn't get that lethal. 
But that being said, I think being upset at this show over the gear is hilarious because that's the point. The show is thematically opposed to this augmentation. This is what science fiction does. It presents abstract concepts in fantastical ways so it can make commentary on a given theme. In this case, what is considered authentic in human competition. When JD beats Aragaki, his notoriety and popularity skyrockets. Much like when Joe beats Kim and wins the OCPF Bantamweight Championship title, does his popularity also skyrocket. I like to think the red, black, gold, and bluish lights for Mikio's gear vaguely resembles the Venezuelan flag where Carlos originates. Two of these boxing bigwigs are actually designed off of coaches in Joe, particularly Kim's coach Joe Dahl Hyun and Leon Smiley's coach Ed Garin. Having AI box for you means that while Mikio is technically a boxer, he's not the same sort of hardworking, passionate boxer like JD or Aragaki or Yuri. This is just like how Jose wasn't so much the same kind of scrappy, tooth and nail type of boxer that Joe or several of his other opponents were. He's older, more well-off, and he has a family and outside life. Yet he's still a formidable, seemingly unbeatable boxer. This reinforces my guess that Mikio is meant to be Jose. However, you could also say the same for Carlos. Minus the age and family life, Carlos is also not a gruff, gritty boxer and yet doesn't seem to lose. Mikio publicly challenging JD to a fight instead of accepting his entrance into Megalonia is much like how Carlos publicly challenged Joe to a fight instead of going straight to fighting Jose. Yukiko detracting from the rest of the association's support of Mikio is a lot like Yoko distancing herself from all the other boxing clubs. Yukio using JD to stop her brother from advancing plays more into her parallel with Yoko who matches Joe up with all of his major opponents for what appears to be her personal pleasure. The show depicts the media coverage of the tournament very predominantly, often cutting to TV footage, magazines, reporters, or newspapers. This environment is the same kind that can be seen in Joe, with newspaper printings and TV monitors. The kids refer to JD as Joe Ani, which is exactly what the other kids refer to Joe as. <laughs> Nambu stopping JD's lashing out on Mikio with a punch is just like what Dompe used to do to Joe towards the beginning of the series, where he knocks Joe out to stop him from attacking the Yakuza, and when he knocks him out to hand him over to the police. This moment of the doors closing on JD's fight with Mikio reminds me of the scene Joe has with Yoko before his fight with Jose, as he slowly closes the door on her, leaving her on the other side. Amen to this scene in the beginning! I was half expecting a Noriko parallel to show up, but no such luck yet! I was surprised by the twist that the kid from last time doesn't seem to be JD as a kid, though I still think that previous montage was meant to imply that, so any references I draw from him I think still stand. Man, they're really laying the stray dog analogy on thick, huh? That's great. Despite the parallels I've drawn, Mikio is much a wholly original character. I like that he's an inventor of gear technology and not just some rich kid in the family. His motivations for owning the company over Yukiko because he's smarter is very compelling. JD's body getting more and more damaged over time just makes sense in general, so I don't think I necessarily have to call it a Joe reference, even when the same thing was happening to Joe over time. The way they show the damage is different though. The blood in the piss and this bruise scene was an effective and distinct way to go about it. Small touch, but I like how Yukiko has this secretary to bounce off of. Yoko always had someone like that, whether it was her father, Rikishi, or Suka. I don't think I mentioned this yet, but reinforcing how JD, Nanbu, and Sachio are a team is really cool. It's in the spirit of Joe, Dompe, and Nishi's teamwork, though being a little more on the nose with it. I really enjoyed this twist. This drama out of not showing up in the ring the night of the match really builds good tension. Again, the only thing closest to this in Joe was that he was just never allowed to box in the first place without a license. And the reason was because Dompe had a very poor relationship with the association. 
but it's not like they were caught in the middle of it without a license. And I think it's also a good time to bring up the slogans that show up during the ED. There's a different one for each episode, and I especially like this one with, if you're crossing this river, don't bother to pay a round trip. <laughs> This is a stretch, but the crappy weather in this opening scene after Joe's forfeit reminds me of the kind of weather after Joe's fight with Tiger, which is the only match that Dompei throws the towel in, effectively forfeiting the match, much like how Nambu forfeits this fight. The low point of Team Nowhere running out of options and Fujimaki asking if the gamble is over echoes several low points in Joe, the two in particular being when Joe is unable to secure his boxing license and is not allowed to box, and the second being after his comeback when the association gangs up on him and sets him up with their strongest boxers to bully him out. JD blaming Nambu for their forfeit is just like when Dompei threw in the towel against Tiger, with Joe saying, <laughs> Nambu alludes to the possibility of JD slugging Mikio before their fight because he gets hot under the collar, which would be exactly what he wants. This is a flipped script scenario to a scene in Joe where he gets Wolf hot under the collar after one of his fights, and Wolf goes to slug Joe, which is exactly what he wanted! I'll give this to them. Sachio not being afraid to speak out against Fujimaki is in character with his counterpart, Sachi, who was very unafraid to speak to strangers or prisoners or the mafia. Mikio looking down on Joe as an animal, as well as calling him a coward, reminds me of how Jose looked down on Joe and calling him a rude yellow animal. You are just a rude yellow animal. Yuri's line about how an animal won't let go if it sinks his teeth into you characterizes JD as well as Joe, because once Joe sets his sight on an opponent, he never let go either. Mikio rhetorically asks whether Yuri is a human or an animal, or rather, whether Yuri is a boxer like him or a boxer like JD. This is a great way to further show off Yuri's characterization and his shared attributes with Rikishi being more of a boxer's boxer than an industry professional boxer. The press hounding outside JD's place calls back to all those times the press hounds outside Tange Gym, which the kids and Joe sometimes fend off, much like JD's fan club. Calling the AI gear Ace isn't a reference, except for this small connection to an anime original character in Joe 2 named Leon Smiley, who had a thing for playing cards. I just thought I'd mention it. Yukiko's reason for not needing Joe because she has Yuri plays into how Yoko didn't need or care about Joe because she had Rikishi. JD surmises Mikio didn't think he was worth fighting, and it's like JD has to fight for his attention, much like how Joe had to fight to get Carlos's attention and Jose's attention. While this coincidence of Nambu reminding Yukiko of what Yuri said about being the genuine article doesn't ultimately sway Yukiko's mind, it does call into how much of her admiration for Yuri affects her decision making, which is like how Rikishi was the source of a lot of Yoko's decision making. JD taking matters into his own hands after Nambu fails is just like what Joe does when Dompei fails to secure a boxing license. Joe is often the one that takes the initiative, but when it comes to figuring logistics out, he normally takes a back seat until they hit a wall, which is precisely how this whole episode played out. So, I didn't actually look into this until now, but I looked more into the title. Megalo is a prefix that means large or exaggerated, so large or exaggerated boxing meaning the gears. But besides the words that have that prefix to mean large, it's also a prefix for megalomania, which is literally one katakana character off from Megalonia, the name of the tournament. Megalomania is obsession with the exercise of power, especially in the dominion of others, which I think characterizes the sport of megaloboxing pretty accurately. These quick shots of the boat in shambles, showing the aftermath of some destructive rampage by JD, was a very good exercise of showing, not telling. It's also not something Joe ever really did besides being violent and certainly capable of such destruction. This has been brought up enough times to really make it seem like it's a thing, but I really dig the last chance theme. 
Especially how everyone in the series says that in English. It's a really stylish way for the characters to set ultimatums with each other that raises the stakes. I wanted to appreciate this routine of Nambu checking his watch as it counts down to the induction ceremony. It's a good non-intrusive way to add that sense of a time crunch. Fujimaki calling Nambu a scorpion is an interesting departure from Dampe's character. They state the reference to the frog and the scorpion story later on in the show, so I won't explain it. But this is reinforced by Fujimaki saying there's a limit to how far Nambu can go. And we literally see this play out in Nambu's scene with Yukiko, threatening to drag her down with him if she doesn't do what he asks her for. It's a toxic trait that I don't think is seen with Dompei. Most of his actions involve putting himself in harm's way for the well-being of others, specifically Joe's. I like that the show is willing to make Nambu a more dangerous, shady character. And I also like how this justifies that first shot of this show being a scorpion. It's just something to reinforce that imagery. I really liked Yukiko locking Nambu in the room and taking charge like that. The act of control and capability is in great respect to Yoko's character, even though Yoko never really has a moment like that. This final scene is well done, despite not playing out how I anticipated. I was looking for something more overtly similar to Joe's scene with Wolf, though given the circumstances, this was by far the more rational approach to this scene. And they made several really good nods to that Joe scene in other places, so I'm satisfied with it. I especially like this motion of Yukiko granting JD this chance by offering the ticket in a similar way to her business card at the start, and I am so happy she finally gets a super badass line. JD developing and practicing patterns with Nambu calls back to the same sort of preparation Joe and Dampe worked on. Mikio even refers to them as a little bag of tricks, which the same could be said about how Joe fought in his earlier matches, relying on no guard and cross counter. Yukiko trying to leave the match prematurely because she thinks she gets it is characteristic of Yoko leaving several matches early because she thought she had seen enough. And while there doesn't seem to be an example of Rikishi stopping her in the same way Yuri does here, Yuri's attitude of being supportive to JD is much like Rikishi's support of Joe in his fight with Wolf. JD loses a tooth, much like Joe loses a tooth in his fight with Rikishi. I don't know teeth, so I can't say for sure if it's the same kind of tooth. For the record, Joe loses a molar. The struggle of Mikio forcing his body to synchronize with Ace to perform at its highest capacity reminds me of how Carlos would tense every muscle in his body for brief moments and deliver punches Joe couldn't even see. It's the same sort of physical life-risking sacrifice that gives them the edge. This... JD gets knocked out of the ring by an uppercut, which calls back to this nasty shot in Joe's fight with Carlos. When JD clinches Mikio and Mikio wrestles him down, it's just like this string of clinches Joe was using on Kim, even having Kim wrestle him off. I'll be upfront in saying that so far, a great deal of these references up till now are very minute. And it's like I'm picking for crumbs. Those have been crumbs. This is a fucking chunk. JD is literally using no guard defense on Mikio, which is Joe's second most signature move. They even call it no guard. No guard no guard. JD loses sight out of his eye during the fight, just like Joe in his fight with Jose. Mikio running at JD for the final blow is just like Rikishi running at Joe for the finishing blow in their first match, as well as Joe running at Rikishi for the finishing blow in their second match. Alright, this is the best time to explain what the show is up to. It's been teasing the cross counter several times, one of the most iconic references in the series. Cross counter was a move Dompei teaches Joe so he can use it on Rikishi, which he lands and it becomes his most signature move. This last shot is not a cross counter, however, because it very specifically involves using your opposite arm to slide your fist over an opponent's arm. Here, JD and Mikio use the same arm on each other and in different positions. 
even though they do of course hit each other at the same time, which is of course what's most iconic about it. But I will give it to them, they shot it exactly how Tazaki would have, with different angles and the opponent sliding off the punch in slow motion. Small reference, JD wins his match against Mikio around the same time Joe wins his match against Wolf. And yes, I've been checking this for every JD fight. This is the first one that comes close enough. This victory pose resembles this victory pose against Kim, just because of the expression and he's hoisting it himself instead of being assisted by the ref. The announcers called JD's win against Mikio a miracle, just like how the announcers and Joe deemed his win against Kim a miracle. And that does seem kind of arbitrary until you point out that the announcers don't say that for any other fight with Joe that I'm aware of. And the episode this miracle happens in is literally called... This moment of JD being bewildered at the cheering and Nambu saying that's your name they're calling, it's just like Joe's debut match with the crowd's unexpectedly zealous cheering and Dompe's encouragement saying it's for Joe. JD greets Yuri the same way Joe greets Jose. Ah! Yo, champion. Yo, champion. Man, oh man, this shot of Mikio driving a sweet ass car with the blue shades, he's looking a fuck ton like Kiyoshi Suga right now, I'll tell you what. God, what am I doing? The regular townsfolk throwing a party at Nambu's boat got me mad vibes of the parties they'd throw in Dompe's gym. This rando villager says JD should get married to his daughter, who hasn't been born yet, which I can't help but be reminded that there is no mention of Noriko in this whole show. If you don't count these two girls from episode 7? Yo, the absolute madmen! That is totally supposed to be Iki Kajiwara, aka Asao Takamori, and Tetsuya motherfucking Chiba at the party. They're the author and artist team behind the original Joe manga. And here's one for the road. Fujimaki actually has another character parallel, which he happens to fit the description of more when he wears that white suit red tie combo. He's a lot like Oniyama, an anime original mob boss character from season one with literally the same scar on his eye. I just want to commend the idea of teasing JD and the audience with this huge advantage of Mikio's gear not being able to read a gearless fighter, but then pull the rug out from under us with this improved model, which they did foreshadow. I don't think I brought this up before, but the idea of rival characters having goals of fighting other rival characters is brought up a lot in Ippo, but particularly not at all in Joe, with the exception of Carlos fighting Jose, of course. Though I'd argue Carlos wasn't necessarily interested in fighting Jose, in the same way Mikio wants to fight Yuri, since Carlos blows that fight off so he can fight who he wants. Ooh, drugs! Probably just something to calm him down, but just another simple way to show how really serious Mikio is. And I just realized they bring this drug back later into the show. That's fucking crazy. I wanted to comment on this line Yuri says about only winners having the right to fight him. This is probably just a deflection to Mikio's challenge, but for the sake of discussion, let's take it as a real part of his character. What about his choice to fight JD at the beginning? Did he consider JD a winner, even when they first met? Even when Rikishi saw some potential in Joe when they first met, he never considered Joe a winner until much later. What's certain is that Yuri sensed that JD was a real boxer which was Yuri's reason for challenging him. So in a way, he's equating real boxers with winners, which also reinforces the theme of the fighter being the deciding factor, not the gear. It's just another layer to Yuri's standards that he only fights real boxers that I don't think you can say for Rikishi. I dug this little bit of JD asserting to Mikio that his name is Joe. I thought that played into Joe fighting to earn Jose Mendoza's attention and respect who for a while never even called him Joe. I didn't call it a reference since that was only very, very, very subtextual and didn't quite hold enough water. As much as this didn't matter since the finishing blow was done on instinct, I liked that JD explicitly asked Nambu to make the call on the last shot. It was a good way to show how far they've come in trusting one another, and I don't think it was ever something Joe asked Dompe to do. And to add to that, the callback in his fight episode 3 was excellent too. 
and I love having that animation for No Guard since we never exactly got that in motion. Damn, though, that line about JD saying it was just instinct and assuming Nikio was the same when it probably wasn't. Ooh, that's really good. Graceful exit by Mikio, though. Exactly none of Joe's other opponents are lucky enough to do the same. Good line with, and the loser leaves with nothing, hackneyed as it is. So ultimately, Mikio was the most original character the show has had, and he was a very fair balance of Carlos and Jose. Lastly, just to bring up another consistent thing that I like, I always really appreciate a show that uses really good cliffhangers at the end of each episode, at least in the first season of Joe, there was often this sense of finality to every single episode that always left me feeling full, even if it was in the middle of the match. JD taking an extended absence from Nambu, running away and becoming lost as he says later, is just like how Joe acted after his professional match with Rikishi. Pepe dresses very stylishly, much like Carlos did. Pepe and Burroughs speaking in native languages of Spanish and English is a callback to how Carlos and Jose talked. Only Carlos was a mix of English and Japanese, while Jose was mostly English with a small bit of Japanese even though both of them come from Spanish-speaking countries. Let's dance. Sometimes I feel depressed. Merry Christmas. Thank you. I will dedicate this B-sign to my dear and attack buddy came all the way from Japan. Well, you know, it's the 70s. Fine! Very, very fine! Sorry that I didn't mention this earlier, but the soundtrack in general is a great nod to Joe's soundtrack. Several tracks are jazz-flavored, like most Joe 2 tracks, but director Moriyama stated that the OST derived from the question, what kind of music would be playing in this city, full of people with all kinds of backgrounds. And I believe the same question could be asked for Ashton Joe, and the soundtrack of jazz and classical would be your answer. Personally, I think the hip-hop, lo-fi, electronic flavor of the Megalobox soundtrack is just the modern-day equivalent of the 70s-era Joe OSTs. Also, this isn't so much a reference to Joe specifically, but I really appreciate how composer Mabanua crafted variations of the same tracks and had themes for each character. This is something both Joe soundtracks did as well, to great effect. Though, I won't try to draw parallels to the corresponding tracks, only because I respect Mabanua saying he intentionally tried to make the soundtrack sound different. So any similarities I draw wouldn't be intentional. But that sure as shit isn't stopping me with drawing all these other references, just so you know. Sorry that's all I have to say about the soundtrack. Go check out Lowert's channel for a real good Megalobox video on the soundtrack, as well as any other videos that will no doubt be dedicated to it. <laughs> <laughs> this call out on Yukiko is great because he's right. She wouldn't, and Yoko probably wouldn't have either. Despite what she says, she's become invested in JD's journey like everyone else. Much like how Yoko would feign disinterest despite her actions saying otherwise. Both Pepe and Carlos enter the ring very flashy, though Pepe especially stylishly. Love the wrestler vibe. Ah, you might think this eye flash thing is a Kuroko no Basuke reference. <laughs> Yuri's first fight that isn't against JD is very similar to Jose's first fight with Sam Iaukea. I pronounced that right. Both are very short fights, with Yuri's lasting two rounds and Jose's lasting only one. There's this moment when something switches on for Yuri as he goes in for the KO, just like how Jose flips a switch verbally. Okay, so now it's my turn. And both of them KO their opponents with just two punches. Though Yuri does throw a couple that miss or get blocked first, while Jose wins with literally his first two swings. Yuri ends his fight with Pepe very quickly, much like how Jose and Rikishi end most of their fights very quickly. To that end, while I'm also a bit disappointed in how long that fight ends up being, it fits right in line with the original series. It's very much not about fights between characters that aren't Joe. 
I'm happy they showed the fight as much as they did. We hardly ever get to see Carlos' fight with Jose. This is a great scene with JD and Yuri. And the setting of being against a river with a bridge in the background at night is mapped just like that iconic scene Joe has with Noriko. Where is she? The two discuss what each of them fight for, and directly confronts their reason for doing it. Much like how Noriko in the same scene confronts Joe about why he keeps boxing. JD and Joe even carry the same mannerisms, looking down, using their hands as they talk, and ending with declarations. The reason I think JD gets discouraged over Yuri's answer of wanting to make her dream come true isn't just his antagonism over Yukiko, but because he expected Yuri to answer in a similar way, since he believes they're of a similar breed. <laughs> This huge flashback with Nambu and Fujimaki revealing information withheld to the audience was, I think, a great dramatic device, and it's not something that happens in Joe. This feeling of betrayal between JD and Nambu, specifically JD accusing him of never believing in him, is very palpable, and something I suspect some Joe fans read into Dompe's character, since he's consistently apprehensive of letting Joe fight almost every major opponent. However, I don't think this is on the same brand of faith, since both Nambu and Dompe have reasons for doing what they do. Nambu makes this deal to save his own skin, as well as JD's. They wouldn't have gotten the ID otherwise. But, of course he couldn't be transparent about that, or else JD would have never gone along with it. Dompe, on the other hand, is only worried about Joe's physical and mental health, since over the course of the series he comes to care very deeply about Joe, to where you could subtextually notice he sees Joe as his own son. But of course he could never express that, since Joe is proud of never needing a parent and doesn't see Dompe that way. At least not for most of the series. All that being said, I do realize Nambu and Dompe both become obstacles in JD and Joe's way, and the two boxers would likely come to the conclusion that their coaches just don't think they can do it. I just don't think it's an apples to apples comparison. It was shown earlier in the show, but I like that the earpiece represents being controlled. JD being resistant to that control is right in line with Joe's personality. Oh my god, love that line. I didn't mention him last time, but Mizuhara is not a character parallel to anyone. Neither is Sachio's dad, besides looking exactly like Jose. Both of those I thought were great ways to tie all the characters closer together. This house party Yukiko's having made me realize how anti-social Yoko was. She never hosted parties or even had guests at her house besides the boxes she sponsored. Later in the show, she'd always drive somewhere or fly somewhere by herself. And even though she's shown a couple times to be capable of having fun, she hardly does. I like showing this contrast because it shows that Yukiko is a much more ambitious, outgoing character with her own goals instead of having goals that tie directly to Joe's. This scene with the knife came out of nowhere, and Sachio considering it before he sees Yukiko with other kids was a great source of tension, not correlated to Joe. Small thing to note since this seems like an obvious thing for a boxing anime to do, but having this huge stadium built exclusively for Megalonia Literally, Yuri's ring that he's challenging JD to enter is a great way to make these last few fights feel impactful. I mention it only because Joe pretty much never makes a thing out of what stadium they fight in, except maybe the last fight. These fighter introductions are awesome. And thank you for reminding me of Brian Hawk from Hajime no Ippo. Uh... I didn't mention the story of the scorpion and the frog last time because it comes up in this episode, but honestly it makes me happier that they draw that connection overtly to the audience and how Fujimaki tells the story over in this montage with the characters. The whole thing is just a class act. 
I can't stress enough how much I love the scene with JD and Yuri. There's this great episode in Joe 1 that had to do with Rikishi's weigh-in that shows how the two could hardly get a chance to talk with each other after they left prison, and even when they did, the two were so awkward with each other that they could hardly say anything. So you have no idea how refreshing it was to see JD and Yuri talk so casually with each other this late in the series. Fuck, dude, Yukiko saying that she can never keep flowers alive. The way the announcer added Naked Boy to JD's title is just like how reporters would constantly call Joe increasingly morbid nicknames like the Wild Kid, the Brawler, the Stormbringer, the Miracle Maker, and the G Burroughs calls JD a chicken in English, just like how Jose calls Joe a yellow sheep in English. You a yellow sheep. Sachio refusing to watch the fight and running away is just like how Yoko refuses to watch Joe's fight with Jose and runs away. The both of them also have a change of heart and come back to cheer them on ringside towards the end of the fight. Only Yoko gets his attention in between rounds. Sachio comes in the middle of a round. While JD is down, Yuri gets up from his seat and goes down to the ring to encourage JD. This is a callback to Joe's fight with Wolf in which Rikishi rushed up to the ring in a panic while Joe is down, shouting for him to get up. Also, the way Yuri is drawn here and how composed he gets is much like his parallel to Jose. Still not a cross counter, but it's very similar to this shot in Joe's fight with Leon, and the dynamic lighting here is very Dazaki. Nabu sacrificing his sight is a powerful exchange for this fight. I'm happy the show finally delivered on this theme from Joe of significant fights having severe consequences. I've only spoiled one of these and won't try to spoil the rest, but each of Joe's major fights has his opponents paying a serious physical cost. None of them were blindness, but it was a terrific idea to have it be Nambu that suffers instead, since he's a character the show has dedicated time to, unlike Burroughs. It certainly makes for arguably the most powerful dramatic action in this show. And this is very minor, but JD carrying Nambu away at the end reminds me of this pretty sure anime original shot in Joe 2 of Joe carrying Dompe on his shoulder which I find to be one of the most powerful shots of demonstrating their partnership in the series. I love how this episode ends with Yuri starting to train. It's just like how at the end of Joe 1's episode after the wolf fight, we see Rikishi starting to train in a dark room. And last, last thing, the subtitle for this episode is Enough with the Gloomy Hymns, Give Me Something with Trumpets, which I like to think is an acknowledgement of Rikishi and his theme having lots of trumpets. So in a way, it's saying enough of this harrowing drama. Just give me Yuri. I don't think I saw anyone catch this, but <laughs> the hope store is abandoned. All hope is lost. 
Also, I very much liked throwing out the cross in the truck. It was just the right amount to call attention to that as a symbol and not just something in the background of one shot and in the OP. We finally get an answer to why JD touches the walls, and it's beautiful. That's not a Joe reference either. Joe didn't have anything like that. Sachio, insert song rapping? Ooh, lad. If you're wondering where JD got that trick of conquering his fear, there it is. The way the gear just melts off of him. Let's go! Oh man, this foreshadowing of Fujimaki picking out the fish's eye, like he's preparing to do the same thing to Nambu, it's a great touch. I think I'll mention it now, but it was nice to see Yukiko's thing with how she couldn't keep flowers alive be utilized as a good luck charm for Sachio, implying he's going to try to keep JD's flower alive. Alright, so I actually saw this coming right from when JD went without gear. This is a perfect way to recreate Rikishi's most iconic moment. Basically, in order to fight Joe, Rikishi willingly goes through extreme weight loss in order to go down two weight classes to where Joe is in the bantamweight class. And just like the extreme pain and lower chances of winning this poses on Rikishi, so it is for Yuri. Only in an even more dramatic turn of events because of what the gear means for Yukiko. When Yuri says, I won't be coming back to this office and just leaves, it's just like how Rikishi intentionally leaves Yoko's mansion on his own to go through with his weight loss. Nambu musing that JD will punch a hole in the sandbag is funny, because Joe does that several times, including the first time he ever uses one. I'll admit, this is me grasping at straws a little bit, but JD saying he's always regretted not knocking Aragaki out reminds me of what I'm sure Joe would love to say to Carlos if he could about their match. Nambu reflecting on how far he and JD have come does remind me of Dompe's reflections on the same sort of things towards the end of the show. Oh my god, the fucking cabin in the woods? The one Dompe and Joe go to train for the championship match against Jose? How fucking wild would it be if it was the same lodge? This is fucking nuts, and I almost forgot it. Yukiko has a flashback to the bridge scene after Yuri resolves himself to fight JD. And Yoko also has a flashback when Rikishi also resolves himself to fight Joe to the scene that also parallels the bridge scene. The scene outside the theater. Oh look, Yukiko visits the lodge on her own, just like Yoko does. When the Shirado group dig into JD and can't dig any further than what we the audience already know, it's just like how Yongbi Kim's group go digging into Joe's past and also can't go any further than what we the audience are told. This is a good question. Dampe even asks the same fucking one! Yes! We get to see how Joe and Nambu first meet! And it's very similar to how Joe and Dampe first meet. Nambu seems to first witness JD from a balcony, fighting and kicking a guy's ass, just like how Dompe watches Joe fight for the first time from on top of a roof. And of course JD blows off Nambu's request, much like how Joe blows off Dompe. But whether this is elaborated further in the Megalobox OVAs, we'll have to see. There will certainly be an additional video covering those. Just not for a while, they're not out yet. Oh my god, of course Yuri is going crazy in the fucking basement, pounding on the locked door to be let out, just like Rikishi, only Yuri doesn't manage to break out. Mikio presents Yukiko with that sedative from earlier that will erase Yuri's pain, but Yuri refuses to take it. This is much in line with Yoko offering Rikishi warm water as a way to relieve his pain, but he of course refuses it too. Wow, I know we only see him from a distance, but of course Yukiko's grandfather is designed just like Yoko's grandfather, only Yoko's grandfather doesn't have a wheelchair. This is also just kind of a personal nerdy thing, but fuck it, this is my video and I'm gonna say it. 
This younger version of Yukiko somehow kind of looks like Season 1 Yoko, whereas the present day Yukiko is designed off of Season 2 Yoko. Kind of a neat callback because Season 2's more grown up redesign of most of the cast represents how all of them mature between the end of Season 1 and the start of Season 2. Twin references here! First, showing the Goggles Kid, who I'm pretty sure is meant to be a young JD despite the hints that it's not. Looking out to the ocean here reminds me a lot of this shot towards the end of Joe 2, with Joe's childhood self sitting on a beach facing the ocean. And second, the lyrics in this insert song reference JD and Yuri being chained together, which I think calls back to how Joe and Rikishi first met in jail, though they're never literally chained together. And finally, ending the episode fixated on the empty ring is a callback to a few shots in Joe 1 and 2, which is sort of meant to represent that ultimately these characters are trapped in this square jungle. This split between Yuri and Yukiko is much harsher than the original, because he's fundamentally taking away what she wants. This idea of a dream the two of them shared and Yuri passing it all off to her is pretty heartbreaking. He's deliberately choosing JD over Yukiko. While the same could be said for Rikishi choosing Joe over Yoko, Yoko was fine with the match but was only very concerned about Rikishi's health. Reasonably so. I don't quite think it's Yuri's health that Yukiko is most concerned about here. But speaking of Yukiko, I loved this quick moment of her releasing her anger, even for the briefest of moments. Yoko is put in similar spots many times, but always manages to compose her anger. Maybe not her tears, but she never lashed out like this. It was exciting to finally see that explosion in Yukiko. I was very happy to see Aragaki back to help as a sparring partner for JD. While Sachio does fit the role Nishi has in Joe, sparring is definitely not one of them. It's also nice that it's one of JD's previous rivals, since none of Joe's rivals ever end up having the same opportunity. I'm also very happy to see Mikio still around. Transformed even. It reminds me of how Wolf later comes back in Joe's life as a slightly better person even having this really cute moment during the finale, but I won't consider it a reference because he's not exactly coming back into JD's life, more just being used to accomplish this task for Yuri. Really liked this line from Nambu, posturing something that definitely resonates in Joe as well, though I don't think I can find a direct reference. I do know Dompei thanks Joe for getting him as far as they do. They're very much a team. This imagery of the burning man was great. The most Rikishi ever pictures in the same scene was water, since, of course, that's what he wants most. I'm happy Yukiko gets this moment with holding Yuri and even calling him her future. Yoko is never this direct with Rikishi, and she's just too proper to hold him in the same way. Yuri even calls Yukiko by her name, which I'm almost positive Rikishi never does for Yoko. On that same scene, I liked hearing this backstory with Yuri and his coach's advice. Rikishi definitely would have lived by the same sentiment, but he never brought up any sort of coach figure. I don't know how many people picked up on this really nice detail that I think is what wins Yukiko over in going through with the fight. It's her seeing Yuri sweat, probably for the first time in a long time, reminding her how he was when they first met. It's like he's human again. Of course, she feigns dismissal in front of her brother. Small note, but it's so weird to hear Yukiko call JD Joe, even though that's his only suitable name. Just because Yoko never called Joe that. It's always either Yabuki Joe or Yabuki-kun. Just want to call attention to this wonderful shot with the dust blowing and the face straight into the camera. It's much in the spirit of Dazaki's directing in Joe 1, though not a direct reference. This last group of shots with various characters staring at the moon really drives home how this show often visually calls back to the moon. Funny enough, in Japan, the moon is sometimes meant to represent the future. Or tomorrow. Fancy that. <laughs> This might 
might seem like a silly way to start your finale, but it's right in line with the scene right before Joe's match with Rikishi, where he and the kids are making and flying paper airplanes. Only here it's Nambu that's being lighthearted and not JD. While it did show up last episode, having this shot made it all the more obvious that Nambu's cane exactly resembles Dompe's cane, because of course it does. So I made this connection before with Sachio, but it's even more on the nose this time. Yukiko riding in the back of a car, not present for the final fight, is just like how Yoko acted in Joe's last fight. Only, unlike Sachio and Yoko, Yukiko never sees any of it. Which I think is meant to be her consequence for choosing what she does instead. While Joe never skipped the start of a match to a later round, having the rounds blur and montage together is right in line with what happens in Joe fights later on. JD and Yuri are fighting exactly like how Joe and Jose fought in their match, with JD throwing more punches like Joe, and Yuri landing more punches like Jose. That being said, while I could go into every punch, speculating how it looks like certain punches in Joe, like I have already before, I don't think that'd be fair, since there's a metric fuck ton of punches in both series, so it's all mostly coincidence. I like this shot of what seems to be JD staring at Yuri's scars, sort of as a way to realize that Yuri did that to himself for JD's sake. This is much like how Joe really focuses in on Rikishi's sunken and bony face and processes that he did that for Joe. Nambu's approach to defeating Yuri about how he's the better fighter but he's still only human is just like Dompe's philosophy on Jose, being this insurmountable opponent but still, he has to be. Only human. I love this image of JD sitting but Yuri remains standing, since that's the same imagery during Joe and Rikishi's first match. Of course, as Mikio says, it's for a much different reason. I love this small moment where JD says when he sees an opportunity for a cross counter, even moving the correct arm for it, which is what Joe often said when going for a cross counter. Stop! I know this is just another common boxing thing, but I can't help but be reminded how Dompe also told Joe to rest until the count is done during the second Rikishi fight. This shouldn't be considered a reference necessarily, but the way Yukiko's arc is spliced in the middle of the fight, basically interrupting it, is also how Yoko's scenes interrupt Joe's fight with Jose. Both for very good reason, which I'll explain later. I thought this was a good time to mention that Yuri not having a distinct coach like Nambu is just like how Rikishi also didn't have a dedicated coach. His other parallel Jose does have a second named Caballero, but he's a minor character. Why the hell? He is here. It starts raining, just like the bridge scene, and of course, just like Joe and Rikishi's fight in the rain. And I think it was appropriate, because the slugfest this turns into is much like how that fight turns up. Sachio losing track of the match and Nambu saying not to take their eyes off from here on out is just like how Joe's last few rounds with Jose were treated. Every beat just stopped mattering and you wouldn't want to even close your eyes for this moment. Yo, Nambu is finally crying! Ah, oh, I hope it doesn't come off as ridiculous to say this, but it's like a callback to shots like this from the Joe OP. It's it's the best! While this vision of an empty stadium is original, JD and Yuri talking like this, even showing this wasteland where it's only the two of them, it's just like this dream Joe has in the middle of his fight with Jose, of him and Rikishi talking and duking it out. You even get this shot of Yuri turning his head exactly like how Joe always pictures Rikishi and Joe too. And on that point, Joe tells Rikishi in this scene he always wanted to fight him for the world championship, which just melts my heart because that's exactly what JD and Yuri are blessed to fulfill themselves. Megalobox really is a spiritual successor. This line Yuri says isn't just referring to going for the last blow, but also metaphorically, meaning going to the next realm, taking a journey to the next life in a way which is something the finale of Joe 2 plays with in this scene with Joe and Noriko. Fucking Noriko, where are you? 
And there it is! I've already explained the cross counter, but it's also great that JD is the one landing it with his arm over Yuri's. This line saying he's living the best moment of his life is exactly what Joe's fight with Jose represents to him. But while we're on that quick scene, credit to Megalobox for reintroducing and then answering that burning question they posed in episode one. Absolutely fantastic. Classy use of character mouths out word, you don't get to hear what it is. My best guess is arigato, or thank you. Which, hey, while there's other stuff that goes through Yoko's head in that car scene too, that's one of the things that echoes in Yoko's mind. They built a new gym in the same goddamn place they built the new gym in Joe! Oh. Ending this show with a year-long time skip is actually a sort of play on the original ending to Joe, thought up by the author Iki Kajiwara, instead of the actual ending which was thought up by the artist Tetsuya Chiba. In the original ending, the scene cuts to basically this image. Take that as you will, but it's definitely not the ending everyone's familiar with. It's far more optimistic and has a life goes on sort of message to it, much like what Megalobox ultimately goes with. Can't be at peace without mentioning Sachio playing at the beach. Like this reminds me of those times Joe plays with the kids at the beach. Gotta put that out there. I, I had to. I, I would literally eat myself out if I was like, why didn't I mention that? Damn it. And what seems like paralysis doesn't happen to any of Joe's opponents. This is Yuri's consequence for fighting JD. Much like how, again, every major opponent in Joe deals with some similar debilitating consequence at the end of their fights. I'm gonna make this the last reference I pull. This kid saying we're gonna settle this in the ring is in spirit to how Joe and Rikishi decide to settle their beef in the ring too. Kind of a cute gesture to continue the legacy. My god! Now for the shit I liked! It was alluded to in the previous two episodes, but this is where they capitalize on the imagery of the two fighters dancing. I really liked this because it emphasizes the fight as a partnership or bond, not just two men fighting each other. After all, if the fight is too one-sided, it makes for a boring fight. This was a good moment to give time to which I think is important to justify, because this is the last episode. So why not dedicate more of that time to the fight itself? This mark, Sachio leaves, means the graffiti imagery throughout the whole show isn't just decoration. I've done this myself, leaving my name on some things like desks or buildings. Leaving proof that you were there at some point gives tangibility to that moment in time. Literally leaving your mark. Which is also what could be said of the scar imagery, but in an external way. I believe this is important to Megalobox because it's paying tribute to a series that has left its mark on the manga and anime medium in the same way. You could argue Megalobox itself is graffiti, left by Ashita no Joe. Yep, Yuri has scars now too. While we didn't quite get consistent representation of this imagery throughout the show, either with major opponents like Mikio or Glenn not getting any scars, nor with Joe not getting any more scars following his nose scar, but I'm still pretty happy with the result. I dug this little moment with Yuri saying it's time to get serious. It's very much in line with how Rikishi and Jose often acted. And oh man, I love this line because I don't think Joe says it, and it's totally in the realm of what he would say. <laughs> Okay, so this scene with the military was very important to give closure on Yukiko and the gear theme as a whole. What Yukiko wanted the gear to be seen as is a way to support the performance of its user. So my reading of that is she wanted to play a more active supporting role by developing this technology for people like Yuri. 
This is essentially what Yoko wanted as well, only the gear would get more credit for the user's success than the traditional ways of support like seconds or managers in boxing. We see this in how Mikio actively rejects his own seconds and relies solely on his gear, Ace. However, the downside to this is that now gear is perceived as a weapon, at least by the military here, but also by we the audience, since it was already being used as a weapon, at least by Potemkin. And so the logical extension of that would be to strap weapons to it, so the gear becomes more of a weapon than an assistant, which goes against what Yukiko wanted, since I don't think she perceives weapons as assistants in the same way she does the gear. Weapons are tools you equip, and Yukiko was building gear for the purpose of being an addition to the human body. But what she created was, by all appearances, a weapon. So she's found to be misguided based on her trying to push and sell the gear as an assistant, which goes in line with her character parallel, since Yoko finds herself to be misguided in why Joe does what he does, and by extension, why boxers as a whole do what they do. I loved this moment of Sachio supporting Yuri with water. It's just one more merit to Sachio's character that I think results in him being a much stronger character than any of the kids or even Nishi. This was a good moment for Nambu. This who are you thing was very good encouragement as well as a nice nod to Joe himself. I don't want to call this a reference, but I really loved this line from JD during the last round thanking Nambu and Sachio. Joe saying thank you to anybody was always a really powerful deal. It just never happened in this manner. You did. Oh, that gets me right. That gets me right in the Kokoro. Oh, yeah, baby. Also, a patron of mine pointed this out. The match ends in round 13, which is how many episodes there were in the show, or rounds as they were called. I think in the fuss this ending may have for Joe fans, that being the single most optimistic ending they could have possibly gone with, which is very unlike Joe's ending. The whole thing is acknowledged beautifully by Yuri in this scene here, which I'm very happy it's Rikishi's parallel that says this. <laughs> That line is what I think Ashton Ojo is all about. I'll leave it at that. Man, it's like three minutes before the whole thing's over and Megalobox can't fucking stop with this new imagery. Oh, it goes by pretty quick, but I really like the idea of Nambu starting a garden afterwards. This isn't a Joe reference, but it does remind me of the end of Voltaire's Candide, which has the characters tending a garden, which is supposed to represent tending their lives. JD looking over where he used to jump his bike off and dancing instead is a bit corny, but a great way to show he's satisfied with his life, that he doesn't need to do that anymore. Letting the kids have toy gear is A, adorable as sin, and B, an excellent resolution to the gear theme. The idea is childish and should be left behind for kids to play with. I'm not kidding you guys. If you Joe fans aren't happy with a scene like this at the end, I don't know what to tell you. This is exactly what Joe would have wanted. And it's such a bold, unexpected subversion of all of our expectations in a series marred in predictability. It's a big fat, things could have ended differently. And I think that was important for Megalobox to ultimately say. However, I can understand if Joe fans were upset over this very last end card that through text confirms that JD beats Yuri. I've been really good at keeping away from Joe spoilers because Megalobox has done a remarkable job at it too. So all I can say is that that's just not what happens in Joe at all. In fact, before I watched this last episode, this was the last thing I wanted to see happen. And with the ending Megalobox gives us, which I still think is fantastic, they did not need to give JD the win. 
even while it nicely reinforces Nambu calling JD the greatest Megalo boxer, and even though JD does land the cross counter, which is known to KO some of his opponents, I think they could have had the exact same ending and made it a tie, since that would still make the championship slot vacant. They can still have their injuries and yet be satisfied by their match, which is supposed to be the point and not a matter of who wins. It would also be a reference to when Joe first lands a cross counter on Rikishi. They tie in that match. But I guess when you're going for the most optimistic ending, for a good reason, and audiences these days would insist they know the results, I understand why they made this choice, but it's honestly the only thing I pretty strongly disagree with about this series. But that being said, there's three, no wait, uh, four, oh, I'm sorry, five, five things I will, I would like to take away from all this. The first thing being, wow, Megalobox is a great show. Um, and not simply because it's connected to my all time favorite anime. Like it was a legitimately fantastic boxing anime, but on the topic of being connected to Joe, the second would be how restrained it was in that you really didn't have to have seen Joe or get any of these references to enjoy it. The proof is clear. It was one of the most critically acclaimed and popular anime of the year, I would argue. And how many of these people have seen both Joe anime? Never mind read the more popular manga for it. Megalobox never had that demand that you see the original. And that's a powerful thing for a spin-off to accomplish. Third is related in that it doesn't even spoil Joe at all, which I honest to God thought it would. Everybody thought it would. I'm super excited that this can really be a gateway for my friends and mutual anime fans to watch literally my favorite anime. I couldn't be happier. Fourth would be just how tasteful they made most of these references. Almost none of them were done out of any fan service. I'll be honest, I was looking forward to the last shot to the pointing to the heavens, to handing the bloody gloves off, to the wolf reference, the whistling, the laugh, the barbed wire faucets, riding on pig back. But they left so many of these iconic references untouched while still referencing, well, a metric fuck ton. Even the small things like giving Nambu an eye patch like Dompe is so on the nose, but they still used it in a meaningful way. There was nothing silly like seeing a picture of Yabuki Joe on a wall or something, when there very well could have. Instead, they give us this wholesome Tetsuya Chiba and Ikikajiwara cameo. It was all just so tastefully done. And lastly, would probably be the greatest Joe reference and tribute of them all. Megalobox established its own iconography. The gear, the motorcycle and the cliff, the scars and graffiti, Joe's ID, the scorpion, that fish, Yuri's vision, the butterfly, that nice boat, the cross, the carpe diem ticket, not dead yet, Sachio suddenly rapping, and all those iconic lines. It's not just fundamentally good storytelling, it's cliche and told a million times for a goddamn reason. I have nothing else to say, except, and you thought that was good. Holy shit. I'm gonna eat some. Holy shit. I didn't. Th I think that about does it. I'm sure it missed like 20 fucking references and listed some really arbitrary ones. So go ahead and argue about it with me in the comments, like for old time's sake. Only I don't think I'll read any of them. If you're an asshole. I make no apologies for my lack of uploads because I don't consider this a job. And if you've been following my Twitter or blog, you'd know what that's been going on with me. Let's just say I've been working on not just this video, but a few videos while I've been gone. But I decided to put this video out now because Megalobox has begun airing on Toonami of all things, which is incredible. 
I couldn't be happier for it. Can't wait to hear that new dub. But, of course, I just wanted to take the time to say thank you for watching, as always, and thank you to my patrons who support me however they can, including A Tree Outside, Beam Burst, Cam, Javion Ramsey, Marsoufle, Samuel Willems, Seaweed Ambassador, and Tengoon. Can't promise exactly when, but trust me, I'm not dead yet. I'll see you again. Oh, sorry, also. Fucking Crunchyroll is wrong about uh, calling a champion Joe 2. The fucking anime in Joe 2, there's a shot of a newspaper, and the, the newspaper literally says Tomorrow's Joe. Tomorrow's Joe is the canon English nickname. Y'all fucks can stop with the fucking Joe English name memes. It is Tomorrow's Joe. Discotech is right. Crunchyroll is wrong. The meme is dead. And I killed it. <laughs>